All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And this is, I think, part six. Not that anybody's keeping track, but I think this is part six of our excursion through the Akshamaya Sutra, Bodhisattva Akshamaya Sutra, the Bodhisattva in, inexhaustible wisdom. It just keeps going and going and going and, until it'll be part 25 and we'll still be going. It's that inexhaustible. Um, but seriously, um, this is a, you know, we're deep now. Definitely, I'm going to, I'm not going to really deal a lot with what's going on. You know, you know what's going on that this is. The, the bodhisattva, inexhaustible intellect or inexhaustible wisdom, who wants to know about bodhicitta, this elusive idea of the, the, the mind of enlightenment. What is the mind of enlightenment? How does one attain an enlightened mind? And the Buddha has told us that there are 10 steps to acquiring this, this enlightened mind. And these are the 10 paramitas and we've been making our way one paramita at a time. And tonight we have made it to the fifth paramita, the excellence or the perfection of dhyana, meditation. So that's our root, the root, the virtuous root that we're working on tonight is this dhyana, the, the, I, I, I am ex I'm so excited about tonight because I get to talk for an hour, an hour and a half <laughs> of all about dhyana, uh, everybody's favorite Buddhist topic, this idea of meditation, right? An essential part of the bodhisattva practice or the bodhisattva path. And indeed, it's an essential part of the Buddhist path. The Buddhist practice has always been <laughs> an essential part of the path. Um, but within our framework of this sutra, which is really outlining these 10 uh, bodhisattva practices or virtues, these paramitas, we've talked about the, the, the paramita of dana, of giving. We've talked about the virtue of generosity. That if you're gonna make it anywhere, if you're gonna make it anywhere in this Buddha land, you got to be generous. And so that's that first paramita, right? A little moral discipline never hurt anybody, right? A sort of, uh, you know, make, you know, having some integrity, that idea, right? Certainly, certainly our patience, that kushanti, that cool kushanti, peaceful patience, endurance is going to get us pretty far, right? And then we're definitely not going to get anywhere without drive or determination, right? Virya, the energy to do this, that's what we talked about last week. And if we've, you know, we're, we've planted those roots, you can see, you can see that the roots are growing. And so now we can get to this idea of meditation, uh, peaceful abiding, you know, you're, you're well, this is the Dharma doors. So we're going to be doing etymology, philosophy, epistemology, Buddhology, all kinds of ologies. And so we're going to do a lot of exploration of this word dhyana. And that's the, the word here, dhyana. Um, you know, an interesting thing. I just want to just to share with you how this is going. You know, I hope everybody's doing well, of course, by the way. How this is going is that you, if you're a Dharma practitioner, a Buddhist, and you're familiar with the Eightfold Path, that classic road to enlightenment, right? Well, you might have noticed that there have been some aspects, if not all of the aspects, of the Eightfold Path occurring in our Ten Paramitas here. And of course, the Eightfold Path represents that original Buddhist program to nirvana, the cessation of suffering. And 
I often say this, of course, but this, this bodhisattva business, this Mahayana business, it does not replace the earlier practice, not at all. It enhances, expands upon all of this, but it certainly doesn't negate it or replace it. And so what I mean by that is that if you're familiar with the Eightfold Path, you will know that the idea of right effort, uh, cultivating wholesome dharmas, not cultivating unwholesome dharmas, but this idea of putting forth the right effort. Right effort actually came up last week in this conversation about determination or drive. And so what I want you to do is, you know, if you're, uh, you know, study Dharma, start to notice some correlations or relationships between the eight, the traditional eightfold path and this kind of fancy bodhisattva ten paramita path, because there's a lot of similarities. And what I mean by that is, is that in the Asamkhya yoga tradition, what is today referred to just as like Ashtanga yoga or the system of Patanjali, there's a lot of preparatory work that needs to be done. Yamas and Niyamas and Pranayamas and Asanas. There's a lot of preliminary work that has to go into even getting to the practice of meditation. That was what I just referenced was in the Asamkhya or the, the Ashtanga system of Patanjali, but this is true of the Eightfold Path. That if you think of the Eightfold Path as moving towards the establishment of right samadhi, that right concentration, but you gotta have right mindfulness, but, and before that you gotta have right effort, and before that you gotta have right livelihood, and before that you gotta have right action, before that you gotta have right speech, right for that right intention, and you gotta have your view right. Right. So the Eightfold Path is this idea that like, if your view's wrong, then your speech is going to be wrong and all these things are going to be wrong and you're definitely not going to get Samadhi that way. So in many ways, you know, of course, meditation, dhyana, this is an essential part of the practice, but it's interesting, you know, where it falls here, where it's like, we got to work on that generous heart got to work on that moral discipline, patience, and determination. And it, there's a way in which if you're kind of well-established in those paramitas, then we can start kind of getting into these uh, 10, these are going to be 10 new steps in dhyana, right? So if you're familiar with some classic ideas of dhyana meditation, maybe like the four dhyanas, and even like the four formless dhyanas, otherwise known as the formless samadhis. If you're familiar with the basic classic uh, Buddhist schema of meditation, moving through these states of meditative absorption, dhyana, again, we're gonna get into what these words mean, but you might already be familiar with like a, a schema of eight stages. And tonight we're going to have 10 stages. And there's something I want to like just reference right off the bat, which is these lists and these ideas in particular, in particular, this idea that like, um, and I'm, I'm only of course speaking to everybody that's very familiar with the dhyanas and this idea of like four stages of dhyana right? Joy and contentment and all these different ideas of rapture and bliss. And there's a lot of um, discussion about this process of meditative absorption, moving towards samadhi. We're going to be talking about this tonight. And I just want you to know that this gets taught a lot of different ways. It gets a lot ta taught by me a lot of different ways. It gets taught by the Buddha a lot of different ways. It gets taught by other teachers a lot of different ways. And I would write just from the beginning, just to kind of get us in, a, in the right frame of mind. You know, there's this great sutra I love, which is about um, Vedana, uh, sensations. 
And this idea of like negative, positive and neutral sensations or like sensa six kinds of sensations from the eye and the, or from, the, from all the sensory organs, including the eye and the ear and the nose, the tongue, the body and the brain. But there's a great suture where there's these two people arguing about the, oh no, the Buddha taught that there were three kinds of sensations. No, 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 the Buddha taught that there were two kinds of sensations. And the third kind of sensation, which is not neutral, neither nor, that's not a sensation at all. And like, so they're debating about whether the Buddha taught that there were three kinds of sensations and two kinds of sensations. And they eventually go to the Buddha to figure this out once and for all. <laughs> Who's, who's right? The, the three, are there three kinds of sensations or are there only two kind? And the Buddha says, well, sometimes I teach that there's two kinds of sensations. Sometimes I teach that there's three. Sometimes I teach that there's six. Sometimes I teach that there's 18, sometimes 36. In fact, sometimes I even teach that there's 108 different sensations. So actually he says, both of you are wrong because you both thought you were right. Right, and so there's, <laughs> what I mean to say is, is that from the Buddha's own mouth, he teaches these things a variety of different ways. And so I don't think there's any one schema here. And so tonight we're gonna be exposed to a, maybe for you a new schema or a new way of thinking about Buddhist meditation. So I just wanted to say that from the beginning that this, this is gonna be new, but it's, it's not new. This is classic. This is pretty classic tonight. <laughs> okay. Um, if um, I assume this isn't your first time here, but of course, what's interesting about this sutra is that the, the Buddha has been giving us these 10 different practices to go with each of the 10 paramitas. So we're getting a hundred practices uh, in total. We're taking them 10 at a time. And so this is going to be an interesting approach to dhyana from the perspective of the bodhisattva. So first of all, even before I read these, what are we talking about? Dhyana, right? So there's, I already said, I made, I made my uh, pr preliminary remarks, a lot of different ways to teach this. But in general, there is a process of, well, the way that I like to teach it, the way that I, that I like to teach it is that there's sort of one verb. There's one verb going on here in Buddhist meditation. And that verb, well, in Sanskrit, it would be shmrti. In Pali, it would be sati. In English, we would say mindfulness. That's the verb, to be mindful. And there are techniques and processes for being mindful. And if you're curious about like, but what did the Buddha mean exactly by mindful? I'm always a big fan of just flipping it, as I say, and just flip it and think of mindless. <laughs> think of utterly careless, utterly clumsy, utterly not paying attention to where you're going, really just mindless versus a more mindful, careful, aware sense of being. There's obviously a lot more to sati or smrti, mindfulness. But the basic idea is, and again, because tonight is about dhyana, I feel slightly obliged to, to, to walk us through this, you know, in, in, lieu, in lieu of actually doing meditation, we can at least talk about it well. <laughs> and so to talk about meditation well, this mindfulness, sati or shmurti, the, the verb, the thing that you can do, which is be mindful, it's usually accomplished, accomplished by a focusing of one's attention and awareness on a particular object. It might be your actual breathing, 
respiration. It could be a candle flame. It could be an image. It could actually be just about anything in a way. But the idea here is, is that for, for many of us, myself included, whenever I go to focus on an object, and especially like, let's say like my breathing, like the anapanasati, uh, awareness of anapana, uh, awareness of respiration. Whenever I go to be mindfully aware of my breathing, I can do it. I can do it for a little while. And then sure enough, I get distracted and I, some, some, something comes to mind or something distracts me. And then I go, oh wait, I was trying to be mindful of my breathing. And then I come back to my breathing. So mindfulness is when I'm focused on the thing that I wanna be focused on. And mindlessness is when I get distracted and like that. And so the verb, Again, the verb is about mindfulness, focus, attention versus distracted mindlessness. What, I'm go what I mean to say is, is that there's one verb in Buddhism, which is this mindfulness. But that mindfulness, the sati or smriti in Sanskrit, that mindfulness, if you do it sort of either long enough or well enough or whatever, but you kind of, you do it, you could slip into a dhyana, this meditative state that we're talking about. We don't have, we, this is, we don't have an English word for dhyana. If, if in particular, you know, we have this one word meditation, this one precious English word that we must you know, use carefully because I've already used it to describe maybe sati, mindfulness. If that's meditation, then what are we going to use for this, well, this dhyana? There's a lot of, uh, again, there's a lot of way people teach dhyana. There's a lot of ways that people teach how to recognize if you're in a dhyana. There's a certain marker of this sort of dhyana. And I would describe it, you know, I, I kind of describe dhyana as a peaceful abiding, but I don't, I don't want it to be a verb. I want it to be a state, a peaceful state where you're content and you're feeling good in that sense of like, well, that you, there's nothing else you'd rather be doing. You don't have these desires and wants to stimulate yourself. You're good. You're actually good with the breathing. And actually, there's a way in which if you are doing mindfulness, uh, that focused awareness, that focused attention on the breathing, there's a way that, you know, if you start to really go into this dhyana, a dhyanic state, this kind of peaceful abiding with the breath, there's a way that it feels so good, you, you would sort of keep sinking like deeper into that and, and, and then getting less and less distracted, less and less aware of your, the, all the all the whatever and the past and the future and this and that and you're just getting deeper and deeper into a presence and it should be comfortable that's a, a, always a marker of dhyana is that it should be pleasing and pleasant and feeling good maybe even a little euphoric possibly even rapturous like really 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 wonderful feeling and again, it's a feeling that's being arrived or, or derived just from presence, just from being. And actually you, you begin to realize, oh, the more, the more focused I am, the better this feels. <laughs> and so you could keep kind of progressing through what are kind of considered some dionic states. I'm not going to get into the dionic states tonight because they, they don't, 
they come up in an interesting way. So I don't want to I don't want to spoil anything. But I just wanted to give you all a flavor for how I think of Diana. I don't think of it as a verb as like doing Diana. I, I think of it as a state of being that is arrived at from doing mindful awareness, sati, focus, shmurti. So everybody, I mean, I assume most of you are into this idea of Diana already. Everybody cool though with what we're talking about tonight? Now, if you didn't know, and I should tell you, you know, because we're working with the Chinese uh, version of this sutra, this uh, Diana, of course, this is what the, the Chinese, and this is the Chinese character, the Chinese translated this as Chan. Uh, and actually what they did is, is they transliterated Diana to Chana. And Chana is modern Mandarin. Medieval Chinese from when this translation process happened or transliteration process, when it happened, the Chinese that was being spoken it probably even sounded closer to jana, not this chana. It's a harsh ch today, but it was actually probably closer to a j. In fact, you should just, add, just because these things are interesting to some people, a lot of Chinese, uh, what we know of medieval Chinese, like how it sounded, we know how it sounded because of translations from Ch uh, Sanskrit where we knew we know what the Sanskrit sounded like. And so we know the medieval Chinese probably was closer to like a J rather than the CH like today. So that even, be, even beyond the Dharma, there's a lot of interesting history involved in the translation from Sanskrit to Chinese. I just share that with you briefly. But what's even more interesting, of course, is that this Chana, which is gets reduced to just this one Chinese character, Chan. Well, in the Japanese language that uses this, they use the same Chinese, they use the kanji, they use the same characters as Chinese, but they pronounce them differently. And of course, what's interesting is that the Japanese is not tonal. Chinese is tonal, right? You have all these four or sometimes more tones. Japanese is not tonal. And they pronounce this character Chan, Zen, Z-E-N. And so if you didn't know, I was, I was obliged to tell you that tonight, this idea of Dhyana is this idea of Chan, which is this idea of Zen. Yes, that's right. Zen Buddhism is Dhyana Buddhism. That's what Zen is all about. And so, if, if, you know, this um, kind of modern nomenclature of like, wow, he's so Zen, or I was so zen out. Yeah, Diana, diana it out. Like if you're, you know, involved in what you're doing, right? You're in your art or your practice, and you are so focused, Remember that word, focused? You're so mindfully aware of what you're doing. You're, again, your art or your practice. And you actually get so focused and aware on what you're doing that you kind of slip into almost like a trance state where there's like, oh, it's almost like, it's almost like everything else just faded away and I got into this Zen mode. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. That's Dhyana. So it's what we're talking about tonight. <laughs> And so just if you didn't know, that's what Zen means, is this trance-like state. And the Buddha is going to tell us these 10 bodhisattva steps in developing dhyana. Virtuous ones, the, the, the sutra says, bodhisattvas practicing the paramita of dhyana, of Zen, regard 10 things, 10 dharmas, 10 things, 10 practices as foremost. Number one, P, 
peacefully or securely abiding in virtuous dharmas. That's number one. I think I'm just going to take these one at a time tonight. I'm not going to even take a peek forward. We're just going to deal with these. So there's a lot of language that we could get into here. Um, peacefully abiding. There's, there's uh, already, I have too much to say, but there is a important idea here, which is the verb for abide. It's, um, it gets used a lot, a lot in Buddhism and it is the ver it is the, it's a verb, but it is a sort of idea of like being in a meditative state. And the adjective here that sort of uh, qualifies this type of abiding is this peaceful, this Chinese character for secure or peaceful, securely or peacefully abiding in all virtuous dharmas. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna avoid digressing into a giant dharma talk about dharmas. <laughs> what I would like you to know though is, is that there is, I've, I've already referenced it a couple times, but if you go back to last session, which was on virya, drive or determination, they talked about establishing right effort and they talked actually about establishing right mindfulness, right sati or shmirti, what I talked about, the verb, the, the verb for meditation. And the reason why I mentioned this is that it was actually in the last paramita of virya where the Buddha started to describe this idea of right effort and right mindfulness. And in particular in Buddhism, Right effort is this idea of cultivating or developing wholesome or virtuous qualities, generosity, compassion, and wisdom, I would put as kind of paramount. And then there are these unwholesome dharmas, greed, anger, and delusion that are not to be cultivated. And the effort that one puts forth, the right effort of the Eightfold Path, is about trying to not <laughs> cultivate unwholesome things, not trying to get good at being angry, not trying to be good at being a hater, right? Not trying to be good at hoarding, right? Good, like, oh, wow, I have three storage units. Like not, don't try to get good at hoarding. And of course, don't try to get good at being delusional, right? So don't develop unwholesome dharmas and develop generosity, develop kindness and develop wisdom. Yeah, that's the right effort. And there's a way, of course, if you refer to my opening remarks tonight, there's a way in which that you need to kind of work on that in order for the mind to be comfortable enough to get into a nice mindful state. It's part of the idea that there's a little bit of preliminary work that has to be done, a little preliminary effort, and it kind of frees you up <clears throat> in a way to then do right mindfulness. That was all last week, but the first step on this, peacefully abiding in virtuous dharmas, what, what this is kind of referring to is, is that idea of right effort, right mindfulness, abiding in, peacefully abiding, for that matter, peacefully abiding in kindness, compassion, generosity, wisdom. That's what this first one is describing, that the bodhisattva puts as foremost this sort of peaceful abiding, which is sort of referencing mindfulness, and then virtuous dharmas, which is kind of referencing the right effort aspect. There's a way 
um, and actually not even a way, well, no, it is certainly a way. There's a way that I'm gonna teach this tonight, which is, this is very cumulative. The idea being that like, once we're kind of well-established in, in abiding peacefully in virtuous dharmas, then we could move on to this, this second one here, the mind bound to one foundation. It's literally what the Chinese reads. The verb being bound to is interesting. I won't go off on it at all, but what this second stage is referring to, and I'm hoping there's not any questions about that first stage, but if so, you can raise them in a moment. But this second stage is very much about, you, you are probably familiar with, <clears throat> excuse me, with the four foundations of mindfulness. I, I hope that you're familiar with the foundations of mindfulness. So there's an interesting Chinese character here, which is the character for a, a foundation in a way. They're well, it's well translated foundation in English. Uh, Patana in Sanskrit or Pali here, so foundation. And this idea of the mind bound to one foundation is what I was referring to in terms of being focused on either the breath, that's a foundation by the way, or uh, a kashina, uh, elemental disc, or even like an element like fire, a candle flame. Again, what the one foundation is almost doesn't matter as long as the mind is bound to a single focus object. That's the second step. And, and, and by the way, I, I said this at the beginning, this is going to sound very familiar because this is this is the practice. So it's going to sound like your your eight vimoksha. If you're familiar with the vimokshas, it's going to sound like the four dhyanas and the four samadhis. It's going to sound like all of that because it is that. So I don't. Again, I don't want anybody to think like, wait a minute, is this some kind of new? Th no, it's not. So it's just a kind of a new presentation of some old ideas. Everybody good with this idea of number one, peacefully abiding in virtuous dharmas, and then the mind bound to a single foundation. Am I good with that right? Cool. So moving on to number three. So, and by the way, I haven't been reading from the standard English translation here. Um, number one in our standard English translation is abiding securely in wholesome dharmas. It's more or less what I said. Number two, fixing the mind on one object. Great. They, they leave out this language of foundation, which I think is unfortunate because Buddhists are very familiar with the idea of the satipatthana, foundations of mindfulness and the language of foundation. So it's nice that the Chinese preserved it. Number three here, I'll read you, I'll read you the, the standard English one first. Attaining poise, poise, by fixing the mind on one object. I, I beg to differ, I translated uh, very differently. I translated as equipoise, the key is not poise, it's equipoise. And what we're of course talking about is upeksha equanimity. That is the key. So they sort of missed it by just giving you poise. Like, are we ballerinas and ballerinos? Like, this is not about poise, it's equipoise and in particular equanimity. And the Chinese actually reads, it's kind of weird, but it basically like, like the mind, it says the mind bound to the found, like it's, it's hard, to, you read it in Chinese, it's like, yeah, that's really it. But it says, number two is the mind bound to a single foundation. And then number three reads that 
that bound foundation equanimous. So what they're describing, if I may, is essentially this kind of, um, um, well, but they're, they're technically they're describing what we would traditionally know of as the fourth dhyana, ek, uh, upeksha, equanimity or equipoise. They're describing it. That's what number three is in our list here tonight. But it's an interesting, very descriptive way of describing it, which is that at the beginning of a meditation, the subject views the object. And there is a subject-object relationship. But through sati, remember that's the verb, the mindfulness, through the mindful fixed awareness, the mind becomes bound to a single foundation and then in this step three, that bound foundation now becomes equanimous. And that is exactly how upeksha is described, which is basically a dissolution of the subject object relationship. If I can get fancy with my language, but it's that idea of what was previously viewed as me and it, me and the candle flame. And by the way, isn't it a little weird then to say me and the breath? But isn't it even actually weirder to experience it dualistically? I, I didn't want to be all Morpheus on you there, but I, there's something going on there, right? Where it's like, wait, that's weird. Why am I dualizing my breath? Anyways, that's the idea though of number three. Step three is this, this upeksha or equanimity with what was previously the object. So now there is just this foundation, but without a dualistic experience. Okay, everybody good? Because we're in upeksha now. We're in the, the subject to object relationship has been obliterated and now it's oneness, upeksha, right? So number four, number four is it, right concentration, samyak samadhi, right samadhi. So I mentioned that last week, they just, in our list of 10, they just dropped on us, right effort. You know, right effort. You know how to do it, Bodhisattva, get to it. Then they dropped on uh, last week, right? Mindfulness. Now, step four, step four, we arrive at the eighth of the eightfold path, right samadhi, right concentration. You, you know about samadhi, right? Right? Samadhi, that's, that's like, um, well, I, I would suggest again, it's not a verb. You don't samadhi. I would suggest that it is again, a state of being like dhyana. And for the most part, and just because I, I don't wanna to get too in the weeds tonight of like, I don't know, oh, it's almost like hermeneutics at that point. Like, what do we mean? What do we mean by all these words? So I don't wanna to get too crazy about it, but there's a way in which upeksha, the, the, the last stage of dhyana and samadhi, there's a way in which they're kind of one and the same, two sides of the same coin in a way. And what I mean by that is, is that samadhi is always non-dual. It's always a dissolution of, it, it is always already in a dissolution of subject object relationship. It's even in the etymology of the word samadhi to, to bring together sama oneness, di dar to bring together as one. So what samadhi is, is this kind of unified trance-like state you know, a samadhi is even sometimes often translated as union, 
oneness, all of these ideas. And if I might, the Buddhist idea of right samadhi, samyak samadhi, it implies that there's a wrong samadhi. And indeed, according to like the Buddha or Buddhism, there's a kind of wrong way to do this, a wrong way to do samadhi. And again, there's a lot of different ways to teach this, but for the most part, most of the sutras I read are pretty consistent in saying that the wrong kind of samadhi, well, how could I say this? Mm, it's sort of like a form of escapism, a form of like oblivion in a way. And let me, I'll go out on a limb. I'll go out, why not? I'll go out on a limb. I'll go out on a limb and I'm gonna make a comparison here. And the comparison is with like, um, well, any number of things actually, but I'll even go out, way out on the limb, I'm gonna dangle and, and say that it's kind of like say psychedelics. There is a way in which even in, even in Buddhist traditions, which is why I, I'm not going too far out on the limb. Even in Buddhist traditions, there are various mind altering substances that are occasionally used in some traditions. And of course, you know, a, you know, a good old fashioned vision quest or something like that, or any number of things. There is a way to um, healthfully, in a healthy way, in a productive way, there is a way to use psychedelics to make breakthroughs, overcome things, all kinds of things. But there's also a way in which you can take psychedelics to forget, to get, to get so outside of your head that it's a relief. It's a total relief from the craziness. And so you, you take, the, take some ecstasy, take some whatever, go to a rave, and it's samadhi. It's samadhi. You are totally outside of yourself. It's blissful. It's rapturous. But I think the idea is that that would be the wrong samadhi. Because you were escaping. You're trying to get away in a way, trying to, you know, an, an anesthetize in a way. And the Buddha was saying that you can do the exact same thing with meditation. You can actually abuse, abuse meditation in a way and do this type of mind altering meditation, but like for kicks and as an escape from this crazy world versus Samyak Samadhi. Samyak Samadhi is always, and, and by the way, I wanna make very, very clear. Psychedelics in my example were okay. You, if you were for the right reason in the right way. So I wasn't bad mouthing psychedelics in that sense, but I was trying to point out how there can be a right way and a wrong way. Same thing with meditation. There can be a right way and a wrong way. I think meditation in the West is so novel, meaning it's so new. We can only imagine that there would be, it would be good. <laughs> Like any, any act of meditation must by default be virtuous and good, right? Well, back in the old days when there was a lot of different kinds of meditation and people were doing all kinds of pranayama, like, woo, there was wrong ways of entering samadhi. And again, it was, it's seemingly, again, based on the sutras, it seems to be a type of escapism versus the right samadhi, which is about even further calming, further peacing, peace and further quiescence of the mind. That is very, very, very helpful and healthy. Yeah, Tanya. So, I mean, it seems like when you think about meditation and Buddhism, it's about ending suffering, right? So, you know, and like, so we don't like make our lives more miserable. So I was just thinking about what you were saying. And it's like, I guess the difference would be like, is, is, what, is the way that you're doing it ultimately harmful to you or not? 
like the escapism way, I think the outcome would be, it would be harmful, right? Like if you do it enough and like, you're just not engaging with what you need to engage with, whether it's like meditation or psychedelics. Mm-hmm. So does that make sense? Cause I mean, cause because I mean, again, like I'm saying, like, you know, thinking about like, you know, meditation, we're, we're trying to end suffering, but not an escape, not an escapist kind of way. Yep. Yeah, I would actually, I, I think you're right. And I, and I definitely think in the examples I raised, you're totally right. It even gets more subtle, though, where it's not, I mean, ultimately, I guess, kind of harmful, but it's not even so much about harmful or not. But Oh, yeah, it's so interesting. It's actually sort of a um, at these more subtle levels, it's actually sort of, mm, yeah, let me, I'll, I'm going to draw it back a few steps and say the, the, the kind of the, more, yeah, it's more interesting. I, sorry, I'm cycling through a number of different things to say. The most interesting one though, bing, 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 bing. I found the most interesting one. It's it's sort of this idea from a Buddhist point of view and even the early Buddhist schools, by the way, there's a certain way in which that type of deep escapist samadhi, it might be good for you. And especially because that deepest type of samadhi that the Buddha was kind of saying that's the wrong one, those samadhis were states, and again, it's not a verb, it's a state of being, the the wrong samadhi were these deep, deep, deep states of, we're talking cross-legged, eyes closed, basically the breath is no longer, has ceased, so you're really just like sitting there in some kind of like still state. And the goal of wrong samadhi is to stay there forever. And the idea from a Buddhist point of view is like, well, that might not be suffering. You got me there. You got me there. That might not be suffering. But there's a sense in which it doesn't help any, any of the rest of us in that kind of bodhisattva way. And then at even subtler levels, the Buddha is said to have realized that that type of ultimate stillness is not actually the goal for a variety of reasons I'm not gonna get into tonight that have to do with reincarnation and eventually being sucked back into the reincarnation pool and all of that. But so it's at, at some, at, at a basic level, yes, Tanya, it's, it's about harm and not harm and ultimately harming the self or not harming the self. And I wanted to say that too about harm and, and not harm. It's not so much about ahimsa, meaning violence and nonviolence, but I wanted to, um, I wanted to say this about what's going on with meditation in, in, in Buddhism there is this thing um, that it's, it's very akin to sleep in that sleep is necessary. It's, it's healthy. We need to rest. And, you know, people try through stimulants and all kinds of things. They try to forego sleep. It just doesn't work. The, the body actually needs it. And even though you might be able to go a good, you know, a good 10 years of getting very, 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 very little sleep. And you're really, really productive in those 10 years. The idea is that it's all going to catch up with you, right? It's all going to catch up. And so a good, helpful sleeping rest is just healthy. And there's a way in which for, you know, from a Buddhist perspective that meditating is giving the mind a, a knee a much needed rest. If there's you can almost think about it if I wanted to like psychologize it, which I don't always like to do, but if you wanted to psychologize it, there's a way in which, you know, regarding the four noble truths and wanting and craving and suffering and all of that, there's a way in which it's all kind of traumatic. 
And so just taking a rest from all that and not thinking about anything and just sort of like breathing and sinking into these nice peaceful, peaceful states where there's not a lot of mental activity, it's healing. And the idea, the reason why I, I say this is, is that, but you don't wanna sleep forever. There was a way in which the deep Samadhi guys were like, yo, we can just get out of here, Inception style. We can just like go to sleep and dream these worlds forever. And the Buddha was like, no, nah, let's, how about we do right Samadhi where we get good at doing Samadhi, very, very good at moving into these peaceful healing states. And then we come out of them and come back to the world, peaceful beings and spread the peace and joy and love and, gen and all that. How about we do that? That's kind of right Samadhi. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks, Tanya. That was, uh, uh, thank you. Allowed, allowed for a lot to come up. Okay, everybody good? So now we're at the, the eight, we're at the end of the Eightfold Path. Right Samadhi established from that oneness with the foundation, which was established by being bound to a single foundation, which was brought about by this sort of peacefully abiding in virtuous dharmas. Now, now it gets funky. Now it gets funky. Number five. So number five is in San, we can, um, it's very easy to reconstruct the Sanskrit. The Sanskrit would be the Dhyana Vimoksha, liberation by Dhyana. Dhyana liberation, is that what I have? Dhyana liberation. So this is where things get a little funky because if your mind is very rigidly programmed with Dharma, you'll be like, but wait a minute, Samadhi comes after Dhyana. How could we have Dhyana after so like, <laughs> wait a minute. But again, I want you to sort of, um, um, well, actually think about it this way. This is a fun, this is a very, very fun way to think about this. Um, remember the middle path? Remember that idea of the middle path? Well, indeed, you can look at the meditate the spectrum of meditation as so like let's say this i'm going to hold it up here and this is the spectrum of meditation and on this side is absolute mindlessness where i'm not just the the drunk monkey but like some other monkey there's just like absolute total mindlessness okay and over here is like the deepest samadhi of no mind like just totally like you could hook all the things, EKG, no registration, no mind, no respiration, total stillness, neither perception nor non-perception, you name it. There is actually a way within the spectrum of meditation that Buddhism is always aiming for that dhyana, like a nice dhyana all the time. almost like almost non-dual and you're kind of like slipping and I could get really esoteric about this but the idea is is that you are not so deep in meditation that you're not with us anymore but not so mindless that you're myopically focused on only yourself so indeed this is about establishing a dionic state 24 7 3, 6, 5. <laughs> some of us it's only in that precious half hour of meditation a day but the idea is is that it's a cultivation and so what this dhyana vimoksha liberation by dhyana is sort of talking about is a much more kind of exalted state of pure dhyana uh, vimoksha, liberation in a dhyanic state. The, the vimokshas, of course, are a class of liberation unto themselves um, that I'm not going to get too into because I want to get through this list tonight. 
But I just want you to know that that's one way of thinking about this step five is, is establishing that, that middle path of meditation that isn't too far in, in mindless samadhi, but isn't too far, of course, in mindless self, selfishness. Everybody good with that one? All of these, of course, deserve their own night of exploration, but that would truly get inexhaustible. So we... Okay. The next one, number six on our, on our path, it ties this in with the whole sutra. And so this is the, ooh, this is going to, oh, I didn't even do it. I got to tell you about something. Oh no, we got to go back to step four. Sorry. It's just about this idea of right concentration. There's this, where's it at? It's somewhere over here. And if you have good eyes and my, and my Chinese isn't too bad, you'll be able to notice that there's a recurring Chinese character and it's the Chinese character for concentration. Um, it's the first character in number four. Oh no, sorry, the second character in number four, the first character in number six, the first character in number seven, and the first character in number nine. It's the, it, it, and the reason why I'm pointing this out is because this character, meaning this word, this idea, it keeps getting repeated a number of times. And so we need to, we need to take a moment and, and, and talk about it. It's an interesting, um, if you study Chinese Buddhism, like I do, study Chinese language, it's a character that becomes very mysterious. And I, and I mentioned how we in English, we have too few words when it comes to this stuff and we only have meditation and meditation is a tricky already. Well, the Chinese who already had a tradition of meditation before Buddhism arrived, they already had a few verbs. They already had a few words, you know, to go on. And so one of them is this Chinese character. It's pronounced ding, uh, D-I-N-G with a fourth tone, ding. And it's, um, it's homophonous. It's tricky, but it has a lot of, uh, uh, it's a homophone with a certain type of certainty. Um, and, and indeed, and even this Chinese character, it, it has this really interesting idea. But what I mean to say is, is that if you read enough Chinese Buddhist texts, it's a word that the Chinese use for dhyana and samadhi. Is sometimes they use it for one, sometimes they use it for the other. And so there's sort of a trick, you, you don't know what, how to translate it. And the normal way to translate it is concentration. And concentration is the normal way to translate samadhi. So this starts to get tricky, what we're talking about. I just wanted to point that out to you because the one that we're about to talk about, number six, is the root of concentration. The root of samadhi, probably, but again, it's its own idea, which is like, we're, we're talking about meditation. We're definitely talking about meditation. We're definitely talking about sati mindfulness. And we're basically talking about that, that line right in between dhyana and samadhi, where it's like, you're totally just in the cut, in the pocket, concentrated, flow state, like oneness, that's concentration. And number six is the development of, or the cultivation of this root of concentration. And in this sutra and in the Mahayana tradition that this sutra represents, there are five roots of which this is one of them. And if you wanted to if you know, if you wanted to have a feeling for what they're talking about, you know, I have my the field up here, and these are all the roots, right? I'm kind of 
um, working with the Buddhist metaphor of the roots and all of that. Well, the idea is, is that this root of concentration that, you know, a, a lot of this, a, lo a lot of all of this, and I mean this Buddhism stuff, not just tonight, but like all of this, <laughs> You know, if there's one idea that gets spoken about a lot in Buddhism, it's it's like conditioning and like conditioned thought patterns and the idea like samskara, right? And the idea that all of this is is like that we're very, very conditioned, very programmed in that way, right? Culturally conditioned in that sense. And so there's this idea that that all of this process, like for example, just for example, Go back to number one, dana or giving generosity. The idea is, is that we are conditioned and programmed to be selfish. <laughs> we, we are, we're conditioned by our culture, even probably by evolution and biology, we are conditioned to be selfish. And here comes this Buddha guy talking about generosity. And the idea here is, is like that we are conditioned to be sort of selfish and actually what we do often is practice selfishness. And we get so good at it that it becomes like second nature to be that way. What I'm getting at is that if that's the case, that this, that this suffering and this way of being is a product of conditioning, well, then all, a lot of this is, is also conditioning, but in a knowing way, which what I mean is, is that if we practice selfishness and then we get really good at it to the point where we don't even notice that we're doing it, you could also practice generosity. And you could actually get so good at it, you don't even think about it. Moral discipline. You might have to make a vow. You might have to actually say to yourself and make a vow, no lying. Enough with the duplicity. Enough with the deception. Enough with it. I'm going to speak truthfully. And you could practice it to the point where you get so good at it, you don't have to think about it anymore. <laughs> And I could do this, of course, with each of these, where what, again, what we're talking about is it, Buddhism recognizes that we're kind of conditioned that way. And in fact, that that's how it all works. And so if you understand that you can begin, well, deconditioning yourself to bad habits and reconditioning yourself to good habits. I guess that's called right effort, right? So here we go again. Here we go again with the right effort, right? But that's that idea. And the reason why I digressed into repeating all of that is this idea of then, then when you really are cultivated in generosity, moral discipline, patience, determination, and then dhyana, the idea of the root of concentration is this idea that like it, 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 it's, it has taken right? The quickening, the rooting, like your meditation practice has rooted. And now you, in, in, in the way that I read this list, where we're at in this list, this is where you, you are now, you don't have to think about it anymore. You had to practice dhyana before and you had to actually say, okay, this half an hour, I'm going to be mindful and I'm going to keep doing that. At this point in the list, after vimoksha, after liberation by dhyana, it, there's a way in which dhyana is now second nature. That's sort of in a way the root of concentration. You've established the root, but again, it takes practice to establish that root. You can't just go to one meditation session and be like, woo, I did it, I'm enlightened, right? And if you cultivate that root, you, you've got that root, it leads to number seven, 
the power of concentration. And so in addition to the various roots that are established in this Mahayana tradition, there are various powers that are established. And so this is the power of concentration. Uh, if you'll notice, one of these is the Bala, the power, right? And um, I'll say this, I gotta say something, right? I gotta say something. So I'll say this one thing about power, Bala, and this idea of the power of concentration, but just power in general. You know how you have an electric bill? I just got, I just got my PG&E bill. You know how you got an electric bill? I got an electric bill. You know how you got to go to the gas station? And okay, maybe you got a Tesla, but now we go back to PG&E. So what I'm getting at is, is that power is dependent. You need, you got to eat, you need PG&E, you need gasoline for the car. The idea is, is that power as we normally in the norm, normal world here, we get it from sources. And if you start tracing kind of like power lines, <laughs> right? The idea is, is that even PG&E gets their power from somewhere. And then even that place where PG&E gets their power from ultimately gets it from somewhere else, right? The sun or something like that. And so the idea is, is that if you think about power, there's an interesting kind of um, nature of dependency, shall we say? Well, I would suggest that this power is when it is in, you're the, you're the source. So it's an internal power, you, you're not, uh, you're no longer dependent on external sources for the power. You've got the power. And there is this sort of idea, of course, um, um, you know, this, this is very, that for me, this is very related to the idea of, of joy and happiness, pleasure. And the idea is, is that for many of us, for most of us, our joys in this world, our happiness and our pleasures are dependent upon things, right? Maybe it's dependent upon the weather to be, you know, if it's a bad stormy day or not so pleasant anymore, but ooh, sunny. So my mood is dependent upon the weather or my happiness is dependent upon the holiday treats or presents or whatever it is. And the idea is, and this is sort of my, this is a classic MC Owens Dharma teaching, that if your happiness is dependent upon something, then what happens when that something gets taken away? So does your joy and pleasure and happiness. It's the problem with dependent joy. What I teach, this is the MC Owens Dharma talk. What I think Buddhism is talking about is the ability to have independent joy. It's actually, for me, that's what the Dharma is. It's why I'm always so excited and happy about teaching Buddhism and being Buddhist and all of that is because what they're talking about is an independent joy that comes from not being dependent on things for your joy, that there's an even greater joy in not being dependent on things for your joy. It's amazing. And if you understand that simple Dharma lesson right there, that if you have your pleasures and joys dependent upon things, you're just kind of setting yourself up because guaranteed those things are gonna go away and then, oh, no more joy. But the idea is, is that if you, through this meditation stuff and getting very, very comfortable with your own mind, one can arrive 
at a state of independent joy. It's not dependent on anything. This power business for me is very much part and parcel of that same idea that we get our power from the external, but Buddhism is talking about arriving at a state where you are the source. You're sort of the source of that power, the joy, all of that, because of the independence in a way, you know? So there are various types of power, and this is the power of concentration. And what I would suggest that means is the sort of power, energy, that kind of power that can come from the ability of focusing the mind. And I'm, I'm talking about like getting the job done. I'm talking about that kind of power that can come from focus. Yeah, I could drink three espressos. That would be energy, power, dependent on the espresso machine. This is talking about the same kind of energy and get it doneness that's better than espresso. It comes from focus and awareness power of concentration. <laughs> Everybody ready for eight, nine, and 10? Cool. So in the Bodhisattva practice of dhyana, after having developed this power of concentration, number eight is, and I'll just go with mine, this is the destruction of all afflictions and enmity. Our English, standard English translation says it's the destruction of afflictions and enemies. I don't think it's the destruction of, we don't want, we don't wish, even on our enemies, we don't wish destruction. I actually think this is a bad translation, folks. And even grammatically in the Chinese, it should be the destruction of not enemies, enmity. This is the enemy, <laughs> meaning the enmity, right? Animosity, anger. So stage eight is the Bodhisattva sets as their kind of goal in this practice. Number eight is the, and by the way, this, the Chinese word destruction, it's too violent actually. And I'm curious what the original Sanskrit is because the Chinese word is really cool. It's, um, I could get really geeky on what the character means, but the, the meaning of the word is like erosion, it decay. It's not violent in a way, it's actually, and, and so if I were to get geeky, if I were to get geeky about the character, it's sort of about collapsing under its own weight this kind of erosion and decay, like a mountainside just kind of crumbling. That's what the Bodhisattva is sort of working on. And so the decay or the erosion of kleshas, afflictions, defilements, in particular, greed, anger, and delusion, or attraction, aversion, and uh, confusion. Those are the th traditional three. And then this sutra, by the way, I've told you this before too, often in the Chinese, because they're working with uh, uh, verse, sometimes they need another character. It's the way Chinese works. It's like you're doing these four character sets and you've got four and four and four and then three. And so even though it's a little redundant, <clears throat> excuse me, a little redundant, to say afflictions and enmity, since enmity is included in one of the afflictions, I think they needed an extra character, so. But the point is, by the way, just to make this Dharma talk nice and juicy, number eight, this is, this is Nirvana. This is the cessation of the afflictions. This is the cessation of enmity. This is what the old school Buddhist program was all about. 
arriving at the destruction of the afflictions, the cessation of the craving, all of that. And so indeed the Bodhisattva in their practice of dhyana has it as part of their practice. Yeah, they don't wanna, they don't wanna be greedy and angry and deluded. No, and they're working on, on clearing all of that out, right? And of course, by the time we've gone through the dhyana, liberation by dhyana and established the root of concentration and the power of concentration, that's what gets rid of all the afflictions, gets rid of all the enmity. I want to refer you to, by the way, what I was saying before, this happens with practice. It's not just like one good meditation session and all of a sudden you don't have enmity. It's, it's a practice that way. But the idea is, is that at this eighth stage, the bodhisattva in this eighth stage of dhyana, it, it doesn't come back. That's the idea. The total uh, erasure of those sort of unwholesome uh, habits. And just because we're kind of uh, running short on time or just it, the time is slipping away again, I'm gonna move us ahead and I'll do the next two and then we'll end with some, any questions and answers and ideas about meditation. But once this magical thing has happened where all the afflictions and enmity itself have been decayed or eroded, never to return again, right? Number nine. There's that word concentration again. And this is the fully perfected concentration. Um, this is, you know, um, we're getting very, very close to Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi here in that sense, Supreme Unsurpassable Enlightenment. What? You know, I can only begin to guess at this idea of, uh, you know, the Chinese is pretty dramatic with like fully and perfected. It's like, I would have been good with fully or perfected, but it's like fully and it's perfected, like, wow. But the idea is they are, again, they're talking about this concentration or this samadhi, fully perfected. I would, I'd, I'll venture a guess. I always do. I always venture a guess. And I'll, I'll th throw out there what I, what I think is going on here. Remember, remember what I said about samadhi, right? That samadhi, which we're going to assume that at this stage in the game, when the Chinese use ding, use that verb that means concentration, they're using it to refer to samadhi. And so this is fully perfected samadhi. And if you remember what I said about samadhi, that samadhi is always non-dual. It's always not a subject-object relationship, right? Well, if you keep that in mind, and then you take a step back to this idea of the destruction of afflictions and enmity, the idea of that stage, stage eight, where I have completely eradicated my greed, anger, and delusion, my afflictions, my enmity, in stage eight, there's still a sense that there's you, the, the bodhisattva, with a sense of themselves as a bodhisattva <laughs> doing dhyana even though i'm trying to be in dhyana all the time it's still me trying to be in dhyana all the time or whatever and that even when i'm in the eighth stage and i'm destroying afflictions and enmity there's a way that it's still like working on my mind i would venture my guess that what they're talking about with this fully perfected concentration now, now, not only is one sort of 
24-7, 365 days in this sort of trance like Diana, they've actually crossed over the threshold and are now are constantly fully perfected in a non-dual state all the time. And that would basically, of course, mean seeing every other sentient being as one's own most intimate self, right? That's what sort of what that would mean is making no distinctions between self and other. So somebody's walking down the street crying. The feeling is, why am I so sad? Deep, deep empathy. Empathy still implies a kind of me and you in it. So we're talking about, and of course, if you've been coming to Dharma doors, which I know all of you have, and you know about like the Dharma dot two idea, the concatenation of all events in the universe, and dependent origination and all of that. That's what they're talking about is bodhisattva vision goggle glasses that view the world in terms of the Dharma Dhatu, the concatenation of all events without distinction of self and other subject object. But that's a deep samadhi, you know, that's a deep samadhi to actually uh, live that way. But that is indeed what is being spoken about here is the full perfection of samadhi where again, you don't have to think about it or try. There's just no other way to be. Except <laughs> number 10. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> Sorry. Except for number 10, which is this wild samadhi, some samadhi, frankly, I've never heard of before. It is number 10, the bodhisattva makes at foremost in their practice of dhyana, the cultivation and the establishment of the samadhi called protecting the dharma. I'll say one thing about the samadhi called protecting the Dharma. It, it actually, um, yeah, I, I could say a lot about protecting the Dharma and the idea of being in the samadhi protecting the Dharma, but I'll say this one thing, and it has to do with what I was saying before about uh, right and wrong samadhi and the kind of samadhi where you drift out to the outer reaches of reality and just stay there forever, or at least you thought it was forever, right? But the idea is that's sort of the wrong samadhi and the right samadhi for Buddhists is like, you do samadhi to like chill out, but then you come back and all of that. So it's sort of along those lines, but what I mean is, is you know, that this, the Mahayana tradition that this sutra represents, you know, it's always kind of, um, kind of putting down or bad mouthing the Shravakas, right? The voice hearers that represent the early Buddhist tradition of monat, like harsh monasticism, right? What they called the little vehicle because it was for such an elite few people. Well, they, they put that down for being too self-involved, that it's about my enlightenment and my virtue and how virtuous I am and how worthy I am. The Mahayana tradition is also not crazy about the Pratekya Buddha, the solitary enlightened Buddha who realizes dependent origination. They realize all of this stuff that, we've, that we talk about all the time on Dharma doors and all of that. But the Pratekya Buddha just sort of sits in their cave, like being like, wow, it's all dependently originated. Wow. But they don't like go tell anybody about it. They don't particularly like help anybody. They just realize dependent origination. The idea is, is that this, you know, there's something, there's something at risk if, 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 you, if this doesn't get um, passed on. It's amazing teachings, it's amazing Dharma, but there's something 
about passing it on. And you could think of that passing it on as a form of protecting it. And so what I mean to say is, is that this language of protecting the Dharma and you, you if, you're, if you're familiar with like a Tibetan Buddhism and Tantric Buddhism, there's Dharma protectors, these fierce, fiery, demon-like guardians that protect the, the Dharma and they stand outside the door. And so there's this really interesting idea in Mahayana Buddhism of, of protecting the Dharma. And it's not, of course, that the Dharma needs protecting in, in that sense, but there's this idea that this is a, a, a rare teaching that needs perpetuating and needs passing on. And this 10th Samadhi, this being in a Samadhi of protecting the Dharma, I would again venture a guess that it's speaking about a bodhisattva being in such a state of mind where the preservation and protecting of the Dharma is always foremost in a way that it's like really at the heart of kind of a lot of action, if not every action in that way. So if you kind of think about the progression here, as amazing as it would be to be in a, in a Samadhi 24 seven all the time, for the Bodhisattva path, it's even crazier <laughs> if you're in a Samadhi all the time that is focused on preserving and protecting the Dharma. So. And that's, that's it for tonight, folks. That's the, oh, those are the 10. That's how, that's how the section ends. So those are the 10. Those are the 10. I don't think we're missing anything here. Nope. That's it. Any questions, comments, ideas? Meditation, dhyana, samadhi. <laughs> cool. I hope. Everybody saw the progression, saw the lovely compliment to the traditional progress, but of course, with the little bodhisattva twist at the end there. All right, everybody, then we're gonna keep going next week uh, with the next step, which is gonna be talking about this pranya, the wisdom. So get ready for 10 practices focused on pranya next week. Otherwise, that's it for me. <laughs>